Hey, good evening, guys. Let's stand together and let's worship. Come on.
bow your heads and close your eyes and let's just uh, for a moment turn this place into a house of prayer. I want to ask you to uh, just pray silently right now as the Lord leads you to pray, asking Him to do what only He can do tonight in your heart, in your home, in your life, in our community. So just take a moment, just pray. you just repeat after me yes Lord yes 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 Lord you've heard our answer now tell us what it is that you want us to do we've told you yes in advance now we're ready to receive it it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this prayer and all God's people said Amen, amen. Thank you. You may be seated for a moment. Glad you're here tonight. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church this final marvelous Monday of 2018. We want to introduce our special guest tonight. Uh, we, we work on these at least a year out, sometimes even further than that. And uh, first I want you to, to meet uh, this guy behind me and his uh, praise team that's with him tonight. This is Stone Meyer. Stone Meyer wears a lot of different hats. He is uh, listed on the website as executive pastor of the Bridge Church, but he's a songwriter and a worship leader. The Bridge Church is located uh, in two campuses in Spring Hill and Columbia, Tennessee. Would y'all give it up for Stone Myers? <laughs> Preaching for us tonight will be Todd Stinnett. Todd is from Knoxville, Tennessee. Go ahead. You got a friendly audience tonight. Todd uh, is, uh, is a wonderful friend, and uh, Todd is uh, the pastor of Black Oak Heights Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. He is a UT graduate. He got his master's at... Go ahead, there you go. See, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fair, okay? I'm fair. Uh, started the first week off with an Alabama fan, Michael Mason. The last week we'll end with a Tennessee fan, okay? So uh, uh, Todd is a UT graduate. He's a Southeastern graduate and a Southern Baptist Theological Seminary graduate where he got his doctorate. Todd and his wife Charisma have uh, six children, six children. They have a nest full, yes. And uh, Todd, is, as I said, is the pastor there at Black Oak Heights. He uh, came to the church in 2015. They have a weekly TV program that reaches hundreds of thousands of people. 
across uh, East Tennessee. Before Todd came to uh, East Tennessee to be a pastor, uh, he was in the state of South Carolina. And uh, nobody wants to say South Carolina, woo-woo or anything? Nobody, nobody from South Carolina tonight? <laughs> uh, and Todd has served our convention uh, locally, uh, statewide, nationally. He has been the uh, pastor's conference president. He has been first and second vice president of the uh, Tennessee Baptist Convention. Uh, he serves in lots of capacity, and uh, we are delighted to have him all the way from Knoxville, Tennessee tonight. Would you welcome my friend and our preacher this evening, Todd Stinnett. We're going to stand to our feet again. We're going to greet those around us as Stone and the, and the band lead us in our next song. And we're just going to give the Lord the praise tonight. Amen. Awesome, guys. Well, hey, uh, we're so honored to be here tonight. Uh, I believe that God wants to move in a powerful way tonight. Uh, I believe that your level of expectation will determine your experience tonight. Uh, we haven't come just to spectate. We've come to participate in what God has for us tonight. And so uh, we're going to lead you in a few more songs and uh, you may know some of the songs, you may not know some of the songs, but uh, regardless of if you've heard of them before or could sing them, uh, I just pray that we would just turn our hearts towards God. That's what He wants from us tonight. He wants our hearts. And so let's enter into the presence of God, entering through His gates with expectation tonight that He's going to move in a powerful way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing together.
was your fault. I was your fault. Still your love fought for me. Yes, you have been so, so good. So, so kind to me. Oh. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And all these verses made up by still found thieves and lies and I. I feel it early, I don't deserve it, still you can.
Lord, we sing that tonight. 
We declare that, that you are good no matter the season, no matter the circumstance. Whether we're on top of the mountain or in the bottom of the valley, you are always good. And we sing that tonight, God, as a prayer of faith. That no matter what is going on in our life, that you are faithful, God. That you are good. And God, we serve you and we worship you tonight, God. Lord, we love you. I pray that you would prepare our hearts right now to receive from your word. God, to open our ears, open our hearts to hear from you, Jesus. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Thank you so much. Didn't they do a fantastic job leading us into the presence of the Lord tonight? I want to ask you to open your copy of the Word of God this evening to Romans chapter 13. We're going to begin in verse 11 here in just a moment. Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 11. I am from Knoxville, Tennessee. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to wait and see what our Vols have got uh, coming up this Saturday. And uh, I do bleed orange. I was born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I am very blessed now uh, to pastor a great church, Black Oak Heights Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, a great church just like this is a great church. I love your pastor, Brother Tim. He is a great man of God. He's respected, by the way, throughout our state as a man who loves the Lord and loves the Word of God. And so you are blessed as a church. Amen. Amen. Great, great man of God. I want us to come to the Word of God, Romans chapter 13. I'm going to begin reading in just a few minutes from verse 11. But I've come to ask you this question tonight. When will revival finally come? Have you ever heard the term revival before? I know it's a term that is not as much in our vernacular as it used to be, but the old timers used to talk about revival. And God doing a work of revival in the midst of the years. I want to share with you some things that I discovered. What certain men have said about that term revival. Robert Coleman, an evangelist, said this. Revival is when God visits his own people, restoring and releasing them into the fullness of his blessing. G. Campbell Morgan, great pastor and preacher of another year, said, Revival is when we set our sails to catch the wind from heaven. As God chooses to blow upon his people once again. I like that. James Stewart said, Revival is the people of God living in the power of an ungrieved, unquenched Holy Spirit. And that's true too. Stephen Olford, great pastor, great man of God, said this. Revival restrains the righteous anger of God, restores the conscious awareness of God, and reveals the gracious activity of God. All those things are true, and I love all those definitions, but Vance Havner, you ever heard of Vance Havner before? A great preacher of another day. He had a way of putting things down there on the bottom shelf where even the children can get a hold of it. Here's what he said. Revival is the church falling in love with Jesus all over again. If people would get in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, then perhaps revival would come. Another man said it like this. I don't know if you've heard this before. I get amused every time I read it, but there's so much truth here. One man said, if all the sleepers will wake up, and all the lukewarm will fire up, and all the liars will fess up, and all the angry will sweeten up, and all the discouraged will cheer up, and all the depressed will look up, and all the estranged will make up, and all the gossipers will shut up, and all the dry bones will shake up, and all the true soldiers will stand up, and all the church members will pray up, then revival can come. Amen? Those are all good definitions. That's all a great recipe for revival. Revival is a reawakening of God's people by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
whereby, as Vance Habner said, we fall in love with God all over again, and it affects every single area of our life. And guess what? It won't just be the people in this room taking notice. It will be the lost people out in the world, desperate, hungry, lost, depressed, apart from Christ. They will take notice, too, that a great work has happened in your life when a work of revival has come. I want to share with you from the Word of God tonight four verses. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. I think if we would listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say for us here tonight, we could find a great recipe for a revival right here in the body of Christ from the Word of God. Let me read the passage for us tonight. You can stand to your feet and honor the reading of the Word of God this evening. Romans 13, beginning at verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed, and the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light, and let us walk properly as in the day, and not in revelry and drunkenness, and not in lewdness and lust, and not in strife and envy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. You can be seated. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word tonight. I want to say to you first of all this evening that revival will come when God's people wake up. Are you listening to me? Revival will come when God's people wake up. What did the Apostle Paul say right there? He said, first of all, that we're to be knowing the time. Well, what time is it? Well, he answers that question in verse 12. He says, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. You say, Pastor, do you think that we're living in the last days? Can I read something for you from the Word of God? I want you to listen to this for just a second. The Bible says when he was asked about the signs of the times, he said, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom will rise against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Just the beginning. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. We call that church the signs of the times. And best I can tell, the signs of the times of the coming of Christ are all about us. You say, well, pastor, I'm not convinced. Well, can I read for you another portion of the word of God? 2 Timothy chapter 3. See if this doesn't sound like the United States of America today. 2 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Does this sound familiar yet? Unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Are you all out there tonight? Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. I want to submit to you tonight that when the Apostle Paul says that the day is far spent, the night, rather the night is far spent, the day is at hand. What he's trying to tell us tonight is that the return of our Savior Jesus Christ is closer than it's ever been. 
And it's time for you and I as the body of Christ, as the people of God, followers of the Lord Jesus, it's time for us to get our head out of the sand and wake up and see what's going on around us all right now. And understand the day and the time that we're living in. Now, let's be honest. When we talk about waking up, I don't know how many of you are morning people. If you are, God bless you. Most days I get up early. I try to get up about 5, 5.30, somewhere in that window of time. But I want to tell you, I don't enjoy doing that. Some of you all do. We, we don't like waking up. We like to put that off. We like to stay asleep a little bit longer. Am I the only one that hits the snooze button a few times before I get up? My wife says, will you please turn that thing off? I mean, we put things off. We put up when we're going to clean our house, when we're going to take care of the yard. We put off when we're going to get in shape. We put off when we're going to go to the doctor. We put off so many things. We put off homework. We put off chores. And what I mean to say to you tonight, based on the authority of the Word of God, is that there is no more time to waste. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, what else are we waiting for? There is a world out there lost and dying and going to hell, and the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is closer than it's ever been. And if we can't wake up and smell the roses, we need to wonder if we've ever been born again to begin with. You know what our Savior Jesus said? See, he had an urgency about him. He said this in John chapter 9, verse 4. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. For the night is coming when no man can work. Let me ask you something. Do you mow your yard out in the darkness? Do you plant flowers out in the dark? No, typically no. We, we work during the day. And then the night comes and we rest from our labor. And what I'm saying to you is if we waste our time not working for the Lord Jesus Christ, much work is going to be left undone, and Jesus is going to be coming back, and there's not going to be any more time. And Jesus says, I've got to do the work of the one who sent me while it's still day and while I still have time, living every moment, every day as if it was our last day on this earth. Paul said, the same Paul who wrote Romans said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Here's what I take wonderful comfort in. The Bible says in Ezekiel 37, there was a man of God, a prophet of God named Ezekiel, and God brought him out to a valley of dry bones. And the Bible says that it was a valley full of bones and that they were exceedingly dry. These folks apparently had been dead for a long time. But the Lord said to Ezekiel, here's what I want you to do. I want you to prophesy. I want you to get to work. I want you to seek the Holy Spirit of God and see what begins to happen. And as he started doing what the Lord asked him to do, the Bible says that one bone came upon another and then ligaments and sinew and flesh until finally it was an exceedingly strong army. A valley of dead, dry bones came back together and made an exceedingly strong army. Here is what I believe. If God is able to awaken a valley of dry bones, He is more than capable of awakening the body of Christ. But, but... What you and I have got to do, we have got to set our sail into the wind of the Holy Spirit and allow the Lord to begin to do His work in the body of Christ. He can awaken us. And I want to ask you something, by the way. What do we need to wake up to as a body of Christ? What do we need to wake up to? My brother's birthday is June the 26th. And I'll never forget that day as long as I live because June 26, 2015 was the day that this country decided to legalize abomination. 1973, Roe v. Wade. Since then, 60 million babies slaughtered 
in the United States of America. We have murdered children and we have called it a choice. And it is an abomination to God. It is such a mixed up time. I'm only 41 years old, but I think I can honestly say when I was growing up, everybody understood here is what it means to be a man and here is what it means to be a woman. And now, let me say this, let me say this. Things are so desperate now that you've got men going into the women's restroom and women wanting to go into the men's restroom. I want to tell you what that's a sign of. That is a sign of the judgment of God because the people of God have been asleep at the wheel for too long. Amen. Let me ask you something, church. How did the culture get in that condition? It was because the church was asleep at the wheel when our spouses, our children, our families, our co-workers were going to hell in a handbasket. We sat by and we kept the gospel to ourselves. And I just believe today that what the Lord sent me by to say to you is that it's time for us to wake up. You know, see, I, I can use those examples of the immorality of our nation, but what about the everyday abuse that people experience? Women abused by their husbands. Children abused by their parents. Families in distress. All you've got to do, my friend, is open your eyes and look around. And I promise you this. If you'll do that, you'll see loneliness, you'll see despair, you'll see depression, you'll see worry, you'll see hate, you'll see anger, you'll see racism, you'll see every other iniquity under heaven if you'll just care enough to open your eyes and look around and see a world that is in distress apart from Christ. When I was growing up, there was a man named Steve Green who at the time was a popular Christian contemporary artist. And he used to sing a song, I guess probably his biggest hit was People Need the Lord. Why is it that the church has stopped singing about, stopped saying, stopped caring about the fact that people still need the Lord? I've come to tell you tonight, church, wake up and look around. Stop sleeping, get up, wake up, and look at the condition of our world. And let me say this, not just the condition of our world, but the condition of the body of Christ is in disrepair. The Apostle Paul says, if revival is going to come, you and I, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to wake up. We need to pay attention. Number two. I've come to tell you tonight that not only revival will come when God's people wake up, but revival comes when God's people clean up. The Bible says that revival comes when God's people clean up because look what he says there in verses 12 and 13. He says, let us cast off the works of darkness in verse 12. And then in verse 13, he gives us a list of them. He categorizes and helps us to know exactly what sorts of works you and I need to be casting off. First in the list, he gives us tonight, substance abuse. The words there are revelry and drunkenness. A tremendous problem in Paul's Roman culture and a problem for us today. I'm talking about alcohol abuse. One of the dumbest things that states have ever done in this country is to legalize marijuana. That is nothing but a gateway drug into harder addictions that ruin people's lives. You say, Pastor, I don't think it's that big a problem. Let me, let me tell you something. I've got a great friend of mine who's one of the best soul winners I know. And oftentimes, at least once a month on a weekend, he goes into prisons in Tennessee and Kentucky and Florida. Wherever they allow them to go, they go into the prisons and they share the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friend's name is Don. You know what Don told me? Don says that he walks around the prison yards trying to start conversations, sharing the gospel with these inmates, and he asks every single one of them, what was it that got you here? 
Now, I'm not talking about if you stole something or if you murdered somebody. Yeah, I understand that. But what got you started down that road? He said, Todd, nine out of ten tell me that it started with drugs and alcohol and addiction. And when they got addicted, they had to do violent, stupid things in order to keep their addiction going. Substance abuse. Sir, man, maybe I'm preaching to you tonight because you might say to yourself, you know what? My, 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 my alcohol consumption is not a problem. My recreational drug abuse is not a problem. It's something I can control. Will you please listen to me when I say this? If you give the devil a foothold, it will become a stronghold in just a little while. Because if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile, and he'll not be satisfied and he is de- until he's destroyed your life, destroyed your spouse, and destroyed your family. Because it's a news flash to the body of Christ tonight. The devil hates every single person in this room this evening. And the devil wants every single one of you to go to hell. The devil wants your spouse to go to hell. The devil wants your children to go to hell. He wants all of your family, your extended family, your coworkers. He wants all of you to go to hell. You know the reality is... There was a demon-possessed man, Gadarene demoniac, we call him. The Bible says Jesus came off the boat, Sea of Galilee. This guy from the catacombs who nobody could bind, he broke the chains. He lived in the cemetery because nobody would have this man around them. And the Bible says that when Jesus got off the ship, that the man ran to him and worshipped him. He was demon-possessed. And the Bible says, look at it yourself, Mark chapter 5, that the man worshipped God. And do you know what he said to Jesus? By the way, the demon identified himself as legion. You know what a Roman legion comprised of? 6,000 soldiers. This poor man could have been possessed by thousands of demons. He comes to Jesus, he worships. And then do you know what he says to Jesus? He says, Jesus, what have we to do with you? Please do not confine us to the abyss. You say, preacher, that doesn't sound like anything to me. What does that mean? It means this. The devil and his demons, they know they're on borrowed time right now. They have read the back of the book that you hold in your hand, and they know that they're going to be confined to hell forever. And the victory we sing about tonight is certain because Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let me say this. Let me say this. The devil knows that. The devil and every demon of hell, they understand that Jesus really is the Lord of glory. But they will not submit themselves to him. And so the only pleasure I believe that the devil and his demons have left in their miserable existence is to try and bring you and your spouse and your children and every member of the human race down to hell with them. And substance abuse is a great way that the devil is sending many people to hell. If you've got a problem with substance abuse in your life, listen to the preacher tonight. Get some help. Come see a man of God who won't judge you. He'll help you get on the road to recovery. What's next? Well, he starts with substance abuse, then he goes to sexual sin. He talks about lewdness, lust. Do we have a problem with sexual sin in the world today? Of course, we know it's rampant in the world. I mean, my goodness, you can't even turn on the television and watch a commercial, see a commercial about somebody buying a car with a half-naked woman draped across the hood. I mean, the way that you sell things today, the way that you market things today, you have to do it with sex appeal. Because our country has become pornographic. Do you know they said that there are billions and billions of hours And billions of billions of dollars wasted on the American workforce because people are sitting at their computer and looking at pornography. You know, it's not just pornography. It's taking that next step and starting a relationship with somebody that you have no business having a relationship with. 
and getting overtaken by the devil. It looks so good. Let me tell you something about the devil. I mentioned this to my pastor brothers earlier when we were praying. The devil has never had an original thought in his existence. He's never had an original thought. You know what the devil does? The devil takes the work of God and he counterfeits it. And he will take sexual sin, he will take pornography, he will take lust and make it look like something so good. And yet when you go to cash it in, you find out that it's counterfeit and your life is falling apart. You say, you Christians cannot have any fun. You can't go out and sleep around. You can't go out and carouse. Have you ever thought sometimes that the Lord is saving us from ourselves when he gives us his word and his commands? If we'll just keep the word of God, we'll be saved from a world of heartache. Substance abuse, sexual sin. Some of you are saying, well, preacher, I'm doing pretty good tonight. I don't have a substance abuse problem. And to my knowledge, I don't have a problem with sexual sin and lust. You might have a problem with pride if that's your attitude tonight. But this one I bet probably gets you if the other two did not. What about anger and unforgiveness? The Apostle Paul at the end of his list in verse 13 mentions strife and envy. Contention, anger, rage. Do you have a problem with that? The Bible says you don't have to murder somebody to be in danger of hellfire. Jesus said, the man who would say to his brother, Raka, you fool, and have that anger and that animosity in their heart is already guilty of murder of the heart. And so the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, guard your heart, for out of your heart flows all the issues of life. Anger strife, covetousness, whatever it may be. What I'm trying to say to you tonight is that if you and I are going to experience a great move of God, the first thing we've got to do is wake up, and the second thing we've got to do is clean up. Now, let's get this scenario in our heads. Let's say that tonight you were going home, you got a call from Washington, D.C. They said, the President of the United States, Donald Trump himself, has decided he wants to come to Tullahoma, Tennessee. And he sees that you're such a good American citizen. He wants to come to your house. What do you begin to do? There are some southern ladies in the room tonight. It's hilarious at my house when my wife finds out that somebody is coming over. They make videos about this stuff. See, my wife, God bless her, she deserves a great reward in heaven because she's been married to a crazy pastor for 20 years. And I'm going to tell you something. You've got a great man of God as your pastor, but you've also got a great first lady and his wife who loves the Lord and stands by him as a helpmate. And she's got a great reward in heaven for that. Our wives go through every mountain that we go through, and our wives go through every valley that we go through. I'm just saying, though, that when somebody says they're coming to my house, activity happens. My wife starts threatening me. She starts threatening kids. We start picking stuff up. We start throwing it in a closet. We shove stuff sometimes under a rug if we have to, whatever it takes. Have you got that one room in your house? You got that one closet in your house that if worse comes to worse, you just shove everything in there. And try, and try to clean up everything in your house. I mean, I'm just saying, if the President of the United States were coming to your house, here's what I bet the Southern ladies in here would do. You would put the paper plates away. The plastic cups would go somewhere else. That china that people bought you for your wedding and you've used about two or three times in your life, you'd get it out. You'd clean it up. You'd set it up. You'd go buy steaks, you'd go buy shrimp, you'd go buy a nice smorgasbord of food so that when the President of the United States came to your house, it'd be a clean house, and he'd be impressed. Now, I'm just saying that if the President were coming to my house or your house, we would clean things up. 
If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We'll clean ourselves for a house guest, but we will not clean ourselves for the Lord Jesus Christ. God help us that a house guest sometimes is more important to us than Jesus, who went all the way to Calvary's cross, took a crown of thorns on his brow, took a spear in his side, took a beating on his back, took all sorts of torture till finally they hung him between two thieves. And we can't clean ourselves up for the Lord Jesus Christ. I know this though. The Word of God says over and over and over again. God's not going to do a great work in your life and my life until we're willing to get serious about our sin. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. I love watching the Olympics when they come on every four years and then the world championships when they come on annually. I love to watch it because just to look at an Olympic athlete, that is a, an amazing specimen. This is somebody who has put themselves under rigorous training and when they get on that starting block and that gun fires, they're trying to run as fast as they can. It's an amazing thing that a man can run 100 meters in less than 10 seconds. But there are human beings that can do it. Do you know what I have never seen those runners do? Every time they get up into the starting block, they get up there and they start taking a bunch of clothes off. I mean, don't they? They get as light as they possibly can. Never once. Usain Bolt, Michael Johnson, all the great runners who've ever run, I've never seen them say, hey, can y'all give me a couple of weights over there? I think a few more weights would help me run faster. If I get about another 20 pounds, another 30 pounds, another 50 pounds, I bet you I could really beat all the rest of these guys down the track. That is a sure way for a runner to come in last place. And if you want to come in last place in this race of faith, then entangle yourself with a bunch of sin. Because you will not run the Christian race well if you're overtaken by sin the Bible says to me and you tonight if we're overtaken by sin we've got to confess that sin we've got to get right with God I love what the Bible said down there at the end of verse 14 we ought to set up some guardrails in our life he says down there at the bottom of the passage make no provision for the flesh do you know what I think that means tonight church I think what he's saying is, don't give yourself an opportunity to sin. You know why? If I give myself a chance to sin, I'm probably going to do it every time. Now, you're not like me, maybe. I'm a pretty wicked guy. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. But I know this, if I give myself a chance to sin, I am probably going to do it the majority of the time. If you don't give yourself an opportunity for sin, guess what? You may not sin. And you can be holy before the Lord. See, what I'm saying is if revival is going to come, I've got to wake up and I've got to clean up. But then number three, and finally, I want you to see this. If revival is going to come, then God's people not only have to wake up and clean up, we had better dress up. Now listen to me. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. He says here in the passage, verses 14 and 12 as well, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what that tells me tonight? In order for me to really experience a great move of God, in order for me to do anything worthwhile for the glory of God, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to get right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know it's a Monday night, Grace Baptist Church, Tullahoma, Tennessee, and there's nobody in their right mind that would have gone to church on a Monday night when there's a million other things under heaven to do if they were lost. None of you would do that, right? Are you certain tonight 
that you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ by placing your faith in him. Have you done that? Do you know for certain tonight that you're born again? You say, well, pastor, I'm not really certain. And I wish you'd kind of not ask me that question. Because I really don't want to get under conviction. Because if I get under conviction, I might have to come to an old-fashioned altar like this. I like that we got kneeling benches up here. You know what that indicates? There's a church that wants to pray. And if I get right with God, I might have to go down to a kneeling bench. I may have to go talk to a pastor. I may have to explain to them, please help me come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I've been coming to this church for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. There's no way I can walk up in front of all those people and get right with God. Sir, ma'am, let me say this to you. If you'll allow it to do it, your pride will send you to hell. You can take your pride to hell with you, or you can lay it down tonight and give your life to Jesus Christ. And you're the only person that can make that choice. Paul says the first thing that you've got to do, you've got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he talks about the armor of light. What is the armor of light? Well, I think he explains that for us in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, what you and I have got to do, first of all, as we already said, we've got to put on the helmet of salvation. And then the Bible says we've got to put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's that holy living. That's that cleaning up that we were talking about a few minutes ago. But then the Bible says we've got to be girded about the waist with the belt of truth. See, if you don't know the truth of God, you'll fall for any lie of the devil. And let me say this to you, church. There are more lies told in the name of Jesus Christ today than there's ever been. You will not pick out a counterfeit unless you know the real thing. You better know the truth of God. Be girded about the waist around your core with truth. And then the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, you've got to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may know the gospel, you may have received the gospel, but are you prepared to share it with somebody else? He said, preacher, I don't think I can lead anybody to Christ. I don't think I could share the gospel with anybody. Well, let me ask you something. Can you tell somebody else what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you? Somebody told me this one time, evangelism, sharing the gospel, is just like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And if you have found the bread of life through the Lord Jesus Christ, surely to goodness you can explain to somebody else how they too can give their life to Christ. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul also says there in Ephesians chapter 6 that you've got to have on your arm the shield of faith with which we extinguish all the fiery darts of the devil. Because in case you didn't know this, I've already said to you tonight that the devil hates you and as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are in his crosshairs every day. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm ever under spiritual attack. Then check your walk with the Lord. Because I promise you this, if you are living for the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil will come against you. He doesn't want other people living for the Lord. He doesn't want the name of Jesus Christ magnified. So if you're living for Christ, you are in the crosshairs of the devil. But take heart. The Bible says through faith in God, you can extinguish every single fiery dart of the devil. I was praying with my pastor brothers a minute ago and Isaiah 64, I love to quote it all the time because I think it's such a precious promise from God. The Bible says there that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. You see, our, our adversary, the devil, is great. The Bible says he's like a lion roaming this earth, seeking whom it is that he may devour. But the Bible says, greater is the one who's in me than the one who is in the world. And I'm not going to live in fear because I have got faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not preaching about fear tonight, but listen to me, somebody, because this is for somebody this evening. There are some of you that walked in this room tonight afraid of something, worried about something. 
And I am telling you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't need to be afraid of anything. You don't need to be worried about anything. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Who among you by worrying can add one inch to his stature? It won't do a thing for you. It'll give you high blood pressure. It'll give you sleepless nights. I'm just trying to say tonight, if you, are, if you have God as your Father, if you've got Jesus as your Savior, if you've got the Holy Spirit as your helper, if you've got the Word of God as your God, you don't need to be afraid of anything. I'm going to lay down tonight and I'm going to sleep and I'm not going to be afraid. Not because there's anything wonderful about me, but because I've got a great and awesome and mighty God. And my faith is in Him. And every single dart that the devil fires at me can be extinguished through faith in Jesus Christ. And then the Apostle Paul says we take up that offensive weapon, which is the book that you hold in your hand. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Every single time Satan came to the Lord Jesus Christ, he turned him away with the Word of God. Do you know why the Word of God is so powerful? The Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it's living, it's active, it's sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and bone and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You can pick up and read any book that you want to read. Some of y'all had summer reading lists, and I bet you did some reading. You will never pick up another book that has God for its author. You say, you know what? Pastor, that's not right. Because there were a whole bunch of people involved in the composition of Scripture. Listen to me. There were 40 writers involved in the composition of the Bible over a 1,500-year period. But among those 40 writers, there was only one author. The Bible says all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped to every good work. You take up the sword of the Lord into your hand, and you go to battle against the devil. And the Bible says in James chapter 4, if you resist the devil, he's got to go. Amen. Send him packing with the Word of God. I'm just saying, the Bible says, if I'll put on the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll put on the whole armor of God, see, then I've dressed up. How many of you tomorrow, church, are planning? How many of you are planning to go out in public tomorrow? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you are planning on going out in public? You're going to go to the bank, you're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to go to school. You're going to go to work. You're going to go to the gym. You're going to go out in public somewhere tomorrow. Now then, follow-up question. If that's you, if you're going to go out in public tomorrow, how many of you are going to go out in public naked tomorrow? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Please tell us we don't want to be associated with you when you leave your home. See, the police will come and arrest you for indecency. There's not a person in the room tonight that plans to go out tomorrow into public naked for all the world to see. Those kinds of dreams we call nightmares. Have you ever had that before? <laughs> out in public, you only have your underwear on. We don't go out that way. We don't do that. We would not dream of going out into public naked. And yet, morning after morning, day after day, we walk out into the world totally unclothed, totally unprepared to go to battle against our adversary, the devil, because we have not put on the whole armor of God. And we wonder why our families are in a mess. We wonder why our churches are a mess. We wonder why our communities are in a mess. It's because the people of God have not woke up. They have not cleaned up. They have not dressed up. They have not put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, I have no victory. Because I'm not living for Jesus. You know, the Bible 
says some amazing things about godliness, holiness. I want you to think about this. Use that analogy we had just a moment ago. If you're going out into public, you're going to dress up. Now, ladies, let me ask you all, ladies and gentlemen, if you're getting ready, let's say you're getting ready to come to church on Sunday morning, how much preparation do you make for that? It might start with a shower, getting physically cleaned up. Now, I know there's no lady in the room tonight that spends 30 or 45 minutes or an hour in front of a mirror getting ready to go somewhere, right? There's no lady here that does that. There's no man that readjusts his shirt, his tie, his shoes a bunch of times to try and make sure that it looks exactly right. I mean, there's nobody here that does that. No young person that makes sure every piece of hair is falling in the right place. Nobody here does that, right? I mean, making preparation takes time. But I think that you would say your preparation is worth the time because when you go out in public, you feel comfortable about your appearance. And perhaps you have a confidence about yourself because you've made the time to get ready. And what I'm trying to say to you is that putting on the whole armor of God, dressing up before the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take some time. Think about it like this. A lot of people love to exercise. And that's a good thing to do. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. The Bible says, exercise yourself toward godliness. For physical exercise, Paul says to Timothy, profits a little. And it does. It's good for us to exercise. But he says, godliness is profitable for all things. It will take time for you to spend time in the presence of God, in the prayer closet, seeking the face of God. But your time will be well worth it because in the end, you'll be victorious over the devil. What I'm trying to say to you tonight is that if revival is going to come to Grace Baptist Church, it's going to have to start in every single person in this room. As much as the pastor tries to do, and I'm a pastor myself, we try to do the best that we can. We try to put it on the calendar. We try to bring in speakers. We try to prepare music. We try to make sure that everything's taken care of in the house of God. We try to create an environment where people can have an experience relating to the Most High God. But nothing is going to change unless the people in this room begin to change. And here is how it's going to have to start. I'm going to have to wake up. I'm going to have to clean up. And I'm going to have to dress up. And before we ever go out and talk about how bad the condition of the world is again, let us simply remember that awakening is not going to come to our culture until revival comes to the church. And what I'm saying to you tonight, friends, is why not tonight? Why not here? Why not now? Why not begin this evening a great moving of the Holy Spirit of God? Here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to swallow your pride tonight. You're going to have to get right with God. And I promise you this. I don't care where you're going when you get out of here. There is nowhere that you're going that's more important than what you can do right now before the Holy Spirit of God. Why don't we stop thinking about everywhere else we've got to be and everything else that we've got to do and get right with God for just a few minutes? Could we do that? Would you bow your head? Father God, I thank you so much for my brothers and my sisters in Christ at Grace Baptist Church, Tullahoma, Tennessee. Father God, even their name is a constant reminder of the love of God poured out through his son, Jesus Christ. But Father God, if we'd be honest tonight, even in a great, growing, awesome, wonderful church like this, it is still very possible that we have crept into a sleep and a slumber and we need to wake up. It's very possible, God, tonight, that we have entangled ourselves, that we have marred ourselves with all the wickedness of the world, and tonight we need to clean up. And Father, it's very possible tonight that we've been walking out into the world totally unprepared, 
and we've not been putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and the whole armor of God, and tonight, Father God, it is time for some children of God to step up and say, I'm going to report for duty. I'm going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm dressing up, and I'm putting on the whole armor of God today. Father, during an old-fashioned invitation just like this, folks' lives can begin to change. God, you saw when I was standing down there praying just before this message. Lord, I was praying, God, please let life change happen tonight. For some people, life change is going to mean salvation. For some people, life change is going to mean sanctification. For some people, life change is going to mean swallowing their pride, getting right with God, and humbling themselves, and getting to an old-fashioned altar like this. Father God, whatever it takes, whatever decisions, whatever barriers, whatever roadblocks, let them be removed in the name of Jesus. Father God, let revival begin in every single one of us tonight. Father, we make this our prayer. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Would you do something for me? Would you stand to your feet? Pastor, staff, I'm going to be standing right down here in front. They are ready. They are waiting to pray with you, to minister to you, to help you, encourage you, grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you please tonight swallow your pride and open your heart to God, place the sail of your life into the wind of the Holy Spirit, and if you'll do that, He'll take you the rest of the way. Our musicians are going to lead us. They're going to sing now. As they sing, you come. Respond to whatever God lays on your heart tonight. Please, lead us. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no Chosen me, love. 
this time we'll take up our offering and uh, this goes to defray the expenses of our marvelous Mondays and uh, we appreciate your generous giving so far and uh, you have an op another opportunity to give tonight to those that have blessed us throughout this month we've had a wonderful month in the Lord amen, amen. and uh, let's show our appreciation to the Lord first and foremost and to these who have come our way tonight I'm going to ask Temple to lead us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence tonight. We thank you that you would make your word alive in our hearts. You're the only living and wise God. And we just ask that you would draw us close to you, that we would be obedient to you, Father, and to your word. We thank you for the resources that are being given tonight. We ask that you would use them to your glory. In Jesus' name. And 
darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when, that's when death was arrested and my life began. For oh, your grace so Hallelujah. Amen. How about a hallelujah? hallelujah? All right. Y'all did good for Baptist saying hallelujah. That's all right. Good job. Hey, a couple of things. This is our last marvelous Monday, but uh, mark your calendars for next August. But in the meantime, be in church somewhere serving the Lord. Don't just wait for August to come around. So get plugged in a church, a Bible believing, Bible preaching, Bible teaching church. And uh, be a part of what God is doing. Allow yourself to be used by God. But next year, the twelfth year in a row, it'll be we'll have uh, our a special time of revival in the month of August. Every year, somebody says, "Oh, I forgot. I planned my vacation, or I planned this, or something." Don't forget, August is revival. Okay, so don't plan anything next year. Because we're going to do this again. We've been having a, a wonderful, blessed time throughout this entire month. It doesn't stop tonight because the Youth uh, Student Awakening Conference is going to happen September the 9th through the 12th. And uh, that's just around the corner. And that's not just limited to students. That's not just limited to, to 6th through 12th grade and college age. So you're welcome to come. It's going to start actually on that Sunday morning. Matt's going to be preaching that morning. And then that night, Noah is going to be doing a concert, worship concert. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're going to have special guests. And that's going to happen right here. It's area-wide uh, crusade for young people. There are posters out in the, on, the, uh, on the Welcome Center desk out there. So you pick those up, start spreading the word. So if you're not revived enough, keep on getting revival, then pick up some uh, posters and be a part of that. Sharon Zevick has started a prayer group Monday through Thursday, 8.30, here at, uh, right here at the altar. Uh, it started this uh, morning, right? And uh, started with four people. I think Jerry Drace told, told about that last week, that Jeremiah... Uh, Lampier started with just inviting people to come pray. Started with four, and we'll see how it grows. So if you're available at 8.30, Monday through Thursday, come to the altar, pray for a revival, pray for an awakening, and it's going to start in, in prayer. So join us for that. You're welcome. Anybody, don't, you don't have to be a member of Grace to be a part of that prayer meeting. Just come, give a little time, and, and, and uh, spend it in prayer um, on Monday through Thursdays, 8.30, okay? Anything else I'm forgetting? Don't forget your kids. You're going to be so happy going out of here excited tonight. Don't forget you got kids next door. Melinda and Gary wouldn't appreciate that if they have to take home some extras. 
So don't just jump in the car and leave your kids. Um, don't get, if you've got kids in the nursery, go get them, okay? Thank you, Stone. Awesome. Thank you, praise the team. Yes, thank you to Noah Henshaw. <laughs> Noah lined up all of our singers and musicians this year, and he has all the connections, and he uh, did a fine job. So thank you very, very much, Noah, for all your hard work and your diligent uh, uh, work in that area. Thank you, Todd. Uh, and I, I will just say this, and not just a brown knows you, but that may have been the best message of the whole month. It hit the nail on the head. It really did. It's something that we all needed to hear. And uh, I thank you for coming all the way from Knoxville to share that message that God laid on your heart tonight. So speak to Stone and the band and speak to uh, Todd after uh, we close. Uh, we've had a good time. Hug a friend's neck. Shake a person's hand there. Encourage somebody as you go out. God bless you all. I hope to see you soon, uh, but I, if uh, you're at, at, from another church, we look forward to seeing you either at the Awakening Student Conference or next uh, year for our time of revival uh, in the month of August, okay? God bless you all. Good night. Have a wonderful evening.